So this morning I'll start with a gata as usual, from the only sutta I know it seems. Yes, it's that sutta again. Mata pitu upata nang puta darasa sangha ho anakula chakamanta etang mangala muta mang sadhu sadhu sadhu. So, do people know what that, uh, that gata is from, those verses are from? What sutta of the Buddhas? Yes, the Mahamangala Sutta, yes, you're sure now, you're absolutely convinced. This is the only Sutta he knows. <laughs> so it's, I do know a few others, but not by heart, perhaps. So this one, the translation of this is supporting one's mother and father, looking after one's children and partner, uh, having an uncomplicated livelihood, sometimes translated as like a peaceful one or a simple one, um, and these are the highest blessings. So supporting one's mother and father, looking after one's children and partner, having an uncomplicated livelihood, these are the highest blessing. So this is, obviously, I think people are probably seeing where it's heading towards, and probably think, what is he going to talk about? Last week I talked about uh, respect for parents, and I was going to include a section in that on gratitude to our parents, thanks to our parents, but there was not time. And I would like to have done that because the talk before that had been about gratitude, so it linked very well. But the, today I thought I'd talk about uh, gratitude or thanks to our parents and how we repay them. So this is its a bit of a shame actually, there's not many kids here today to, <laughs> to actually hear the talk. But it doesn't matter, we all have parents, so this is a, um, some reflection for all people actually. And one of the, uh, one of the things that came to mind for, for me actually when I was thinking of this talk almost immediately was uh, these words, I'll ask you, then give you a quiz, who said this? And this is a quote from, it's like a poem really, extended poem. Your children are not your children, it's actually more about children but no matter. Your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. They come through you, but not from you. And, th and though they are with you, yet they belong not to you. Lovely words, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely. Goddamn one. <laughs> not a difficult one. So your children are not your children. That's a bit of a co contradiction, isn't it? Most parents think, well, come on, <laughs> come on. Uh, they are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. We would say in Buddhism that they're the sons and daughters of their karma. Their karma is bringing them back to a rebirth in the human realm. Good karma. And uh, with particular parents, with, uh, because of that karma, that link, that karmic relationship. And I remember last time we talked about those uh, difficult parents, you know, that, you know, uh, that people are born with sometimes. You know, we say the parents from hell. And they come through you. So Kahil Gibran says in the prophet, they come through you, but not from you. Now that's a very important distinction. That often in the West people, we, we don't take that point of view because we, in the West, there's not this idea of rebirth. So in other words, they feel, we feel that our children are the product of um, our relationship and how they turn out is how we shape them. For, for better or worse, actually. But in a context of Buddhism and, a, um, and a spirituality in Asia in general, we would say that they come from previous lives. So therefore they come through you, but not from you. So it's a, quite a, it's a very important distinction, actually, because it, it means that you don't take total responsibility. You're not totally responsible as parents for how your children turn out, <laughs> whether it be good or not so good. And though they are with you, you certainly know that, most parents know that, yet they belong not to you. And I think most parents experience that very, very much in the teenage years when, when the, the children are separating, as it were, psychologically and physically often, often the case, breaking away from their parents. But I won't continue with Kahil Gibran, though the prophet is very well worth reading. It's very, uh, 
um, oriented towards God. It's kind of Christian, but it isn't. It's a, probably towards the, yeah, Islam, actually. But it's very beautiful and very many uh, points in it that I, I don't know how they sit with Islam or Christianity, actually, because they wouldn't necessarily agree with those points of view. So I wanted to give an unforgettable teaching from the, the, the Buddha about uh, how we repay our parents. And I mentioned it, I think, in previous talks, because such a stunning, stunning, stunning teaching. teaching. And uh, the Buddha, I think, when he used these similes, um, he intended them to be unforgettable. They're literally unforgettable because you might try to forget some of these similes, but you, you won't be able to, I think. And this is one of them, and it's about parents. And uh, he says, monks, there are two persons that cannot easily be repaid. What two? One's mother and father. So that's the, the setting for it. And this is the simile. Even if one should carry one's mother on one shoulder and one's father on the other shoulder, and while doing so, uh, they should live a, hundred, a lifespan of a hundred years, live for a hundred years, he repeats it. And if one should attend to them by anointing them with balms, by massaging, bathing and rubbing their limbs, and, even, and they even void their urine and their excrement there, one still would not have done enough for one's parents nor would one have repaid them. Gee, that's unforgettable, isn't it? You can just imagine the idea of one parent on, on each shoulder is just amazing. And so that sticks in the mind. Then he continues, because of course, you know, then you have begs the question of how do you repay your parents? And continues, even if one were to establish one's parents as the supreme lords and rulers over this great earth, abounding in the seven treasures, one still would not have done enough for one's parents, nor would one have repaid them. So he's making a very strong point. For what reason? This is lovely. Parents are of great help to their children. They bring them up, feed them, and show them the world. And that's lovely. And then, of course, the Buddha, having said all that, he's really setting it up for his teaching, which is, but monks... If when one's parents lack faith, one encourage, encourages, settles and establishes them in faith. And then he continues. If when one's parents are immoral, one encourages, settles and establishes them in virtuous behaviour. If when one's parents are miserly, one encourages, settles and establishes them in generosity. If when one's parents are unwise, one encourages, settles, and establishes them in wisdom. And then he says, in such a way, one has done enough for one's parents, repaid them, and done more than enough for them. So that's, that's pretty, <laughs> pretty amazing to do those five things for your, four, uh, four things for your parents is, is quite amazing. And of course, which person did that for his parents? Can you think? The Buddha. <laughs> he did it for his parents. All those things, actually, because his father became an anagami, third stage of enlightenment, and his mother, who passed away at, uh, soon after his birth, she was in the heavenly realm, they say, uh, perhaps, I think, established in one of the paths of enlightenment too. And his stepmother, who actually probably he regarded as his mother, was Mahapajapati, who became a bhikkhuni, and she became fully enlightened. So he more than repaid his parents, actually. So, and I, I would uh, challenge anybody to try and forget that simile. <laughs> you may not remember this talk at all, but that simile will stick in the mind, I think. It sticks in my mind, it always has. And the, when the Buddha is talking about if one establishes one's unbelieving parents in faith, he's... It's interesting, you know, I've heard some monks who've taught this sutta, Ajahn Jayasaro, and he's, he's teaching that it's not necessarily in the Buddhist faith, necessarily, but just in faith in the, the power of goodness, um, in the power of virtue, these things, you know, to have faith in spiritual teachings, you know. Um, and he would say that it wasn't particularly specific, but of course 
in a Buddhist context, we think of establishing in faith in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. And the most, one of the most famous examples of this was Visakha. I think most people, most Buddhists know Visakha. She was the foremost uh, female lay disciple. So she was, she was also uh, had attained the first stage of enlightenment, Sotapanna or so on. And when she was quite young, I think the first time she met the Buddha, actually, the Buddha gave a teaching, I think she became a uh, so on then. And she became, she got married, she was uh, uh, married to a uh, very wealthy family in Savati, but they weren't Buddhists. And her father-in-law was actually a Jain practitioner, another religion in India at the time. And so he wouldn't have a bar of, you know, her offering anything to the, the monks and so on. And uh, he certainly wasn't interested in being involved. And, and his name was Migara. Migara was his name. And so one day um, uh, the monks came to the, to the house. I think she gave alms outside. But she said, um, she mentioned that, oh, her father wouldn't be offering, father-in-law wouldn't be offering any alms. He was living on stale food. Stale food, old food. And he heard that, the father-in-law heard that and was absolutely outraged. What did she mean by this? <laughs> and he became very upset and there was a big altercation over it actually. And she was almost ready to leave. Uh, but what she, uh, and, uh, what, he, what she meant by that, he was living on his old karma, karma vipaka, the results of his previous good, good actions, his previous dana in other situations, in other, other lives presumably, also to the Jains, you know, because he gave to the Jains. And so as a part of the making up between Visaka and her father-in-law, she said, yes, you can invite that monk, <laughs> the Buddha, <laughs> for Adani to the house, but I won't be there, but I'll be behind a curtain. And uh, so he hid behind a curtain and Visaka offered the Dani, the Dana, and offered the lunch Dana. And then uh, after that, as tradition, as it is traditionally the case, the Buddha gave a, a teaching. And uh, at that teaching, her father-in-law gained faith. He became, I think he even became a Sotapanna, a Soan at that time, sitting behind the curtain. And so forever after, Visa, she, was, uh, she was known as Migara's mother. Or he, yeah, she was known as Migara's mother. So her father was born into faith, as it were, into Buddhism. And uh, this is uh, what, uh, what she did for him. Very interesting, now I'll mention this one too, because this is more stunning in a sense. Venerable Sariputta, you've heard of Venerable Sariputta. He was the foremost of the Buddha's disciples in wisdom, wasn't he? But believe it or not, his family had no faith in Buddhism. Interesting, isn't it? His mother in particular. Uh, Sari is, uh, Sari Putta, of course, what does it mean? It's son of Sari. So this must have been her name, actually, Sari Putta. Um, and she would, he was from a Brahmin family, so very proud and probably very traditional. And it was only when Venerable Sari Putta came, returned to his family home, and uh, when he would return, actually, on all the occasions that he returned, she would often scold him and, and uh, you know, belittle Buddhism and uh, run down the Buddha and all these sorts of things. But when he returned home, just when he was about to pass away, he was going to die, he was staying at her home. And uh, all these beings, celestial beings, heavenly beings, were coming to pay respects to him because he was passing away. And uh, they say uh, in the text that Mahabrahma, this is the greatest one of the, all these heavenly beings, still impermanent, <laughs> came to pay respects. And when these beings come, heavenly beings, they f they're like a huge amount of light. And his mother saw this light coming from the room and asked him, you know, what was going on. And um, so uh, he told her that Mahabrahma had come to pay respects because he was passing away soon. And then, only then did she realise, and only then did she gain faith in her son. He's the foremost in wisdom. So you would have thought, you know, that she would have been the first on board. <laughs> but she wasn't. And it was only when he was passing away that she gained faith. Because she realised Mahabrahma, who she worshipped, who she thought was the ultimate in the universe, in, in uh, existence, he was coming to pay respects to her son, whom she had completely, you know, uh, um, discounted actually, and was obviously often very negative about. 
But faith is very important. Uh, it's not, in Buddhism, of course, faith is not the basis for the religion. Like in Christianity, Islam, Judaism, you have to have faith in God, Jesus, or the prophet. If you don't, you're not a member. But in Buddhism, faith is not the defining characteristic. Of course, you have to have some faith in the sense that you think it's worthwhile listening to the Buddha's teachings, worthwhile perhaps practicing, trying them out, and worthwhile um, finding out the results. But the Buddha's teachings always aimed at experience, our experience. And I always point out that the Buddha's wisdom is his wisdom, it's not ours. It's only borrowed until we realize it. And that's what he wants us to do, walk the path. He says he cannot walk the path for us. We have to do it. He just points out the way. This is a very different approach, faith, where faith, uh, the role of faith. But faith is important, or confidence is important, because it gives us energy and it leads to the what we call the five indriyas. So if you have faith, then you have energy. You think, wow, this is worth trying out. And then after that, you can develop mindfulness, sati, uh, as a, as a, uh, because you've got this energy, this interest, and the teachings are pointing at the present moment. And from that, one can develop samadhi. This is one-pointedness of mind, where you can really go deep into things. And then once we've gone deep into things, can develop wisdom and understanding of things that we... quite different from what we perhaps thought before. Because wisdom, and insight in particular, is always going to surprise us, always going to shock us. Because we, we have an idea of the world, and then inside actually shows us, no, it's not like that. And we'll get, you know, get to see, for instance, the big, the big issues, the big aspects of reality, which is impermanence, nothing lasts, that things are unsatisfactory. And there's no permanent abiding self in this whole process of our bodies and minds. Just an ongoing work in progress. <laughs> and then the second thing the Buddha uh, talked about was, but if one establishes one's uh, immoral parents in virtue. So this is very important, actually. I think if you could even manage one of these four, I think you're, pretty, you're on your way to repaying your parents, actually. Very much so, I think. So if one's parents are immoral and one establishes them in virtue, why is that important? Because if one does that, that's the basis of merit. That's what leads to our rebirth. It leads to our happiness here and now. Because if, if we're immoral, if we, for instance, kill living beings, particularly human beings, we'll be in trouble. If we steal, it's going to cause a lot of problems for us in this life. If we break up other people's relationships, uh, this is like adultery and so on, affairs and whatnot. This causes incredible damage and, and, and unhappiness in this life. And of course, if we tell lies, that can also create in, uh, a lot of mistrust, for instance, and unhappiness uh, for people. And alcohol and drugs, they're a good basis for all the others. <laughs> and for a lack of clarity, a lack of sensitivity to what, uh, what's really happening in the present moment. So this leads to a good rebirth. It leads to happiness here and now and a good rebirth. It's also the foundation for meditation. If we don't have sila, when we sit down to meditate, these things will return to us like homing pigeons. They'll come back. What I said, what I did, will come back to us and will disturb the mind. So they give a basis for meditation, for the uh, uh, developing of meditation, but also they're the basis for practicing the Noble Eightfold Path and developing wisdom. They're so important. In fact, I think uh, virtue or sila, morality, ethical conduct is number one, number one. If people do nothing else, this, this is a great contribution to their own happiness, the happiness of people they come into contact with, their family, their friends, the, uh, the people at school and work, It'd be, and also to the society they live in and to the world. And most people are not interested in becoming enlightened. Now, I would say that's probably number one. And so this teaching on sila is, is, is perhaps the most important because it will lead to a happy life here and now and benefit so many people. And then people may want to go on, develop the meditation and develop the wisdom that liberates. But if, first of all, if they stop killing each other, stop stealing, breaking up relationships, stop lying and taking alcohol and drugs, that's a great contribution. And the third thing that the Buddha was talking about, uh, I think
think it's number three, yes, yes, number three, is, uh, but if one establishes one's stingy or mean parent in generosity, and uh, this is uh, the basis for merit too, this, is, this leads to uh, good results in this life and in future lives. But unlike, um, unlike virtue, keeping the five precepts, it doesn't lead you to a, necessarily to a good destination. So in other words, people who only do dana, they'll get a, wherever they are reborn, it'll be good quality. Whatever it is, that life will be good quality. Um, and for instance, I say, you know, we see here pets in Australia, we see dogs and cats and so on. Some of them live in the lap of luxury, better than people do, <laughs> do in many countries. <laughs> and I say, ah, they were practicing dana, they were practicing generosity, but they weren't practicing virtue or uh, moral conduct, ethical, with ethical conduct, ethical behavior, because that's what leads to a good rebirth. Dana, I say, you know, giving generosity leads to quality control. You get good quality, whatever the rebirth is, but it doesn't determine where you're reborn. So number one is, of course, ethical behavior, ethical conduct. And the fourth thing the Buddha was talking about, but if one encourages, settles and establishes one's ignorant parents in wisdom, isn't that a funny term, ignorant parents? <laughs> Maybe there's a better word for that. I don't think they'd be very happy with that. <laughs> so even though I said with faith, it may not be that when we establish somebody, our parent, one of our parents in faith, it may not necessarily have to be the Buddhist faith. If we establish them in wisdom, it's pointing to Buddhism actually. Because the most important thing, what is the most important thing in terms of wisdom? It's the, the key to the path, really. It always comes down to it. There are very few things that <laughs> right view, samaditi, isn't it? Right view, that's the, that's the, uh, the so important. It's the first, uh, first step on the Noble Eightfold Path. It's the basis for the path, actually. And this is the view that there is karma, there are results from what we do and say and think. And there is rebirth, there is dana, giving, there is the power of giving it does actually have a result, a, a very powerful result. And interestingly enough, the Buddha says, and that there are parents. So he's, he's saying this is part of right view too, that our parents are special, we have a special relationship to them. And he mentions them in right view. The fact that he mentions them is really significant because he could mention a lot of other things, but he doesn't. And the last thing that is a, an aspect of right view is that there are enlightened beings or awakened beings in the world who, who have seen by their own direct insight, direct experience, the nature of this world and the other world, you know, life here and other lives. And of course, this is a right view. If, if you can take it further, you know, the, of course, one could establish one's parents in the Four Noble Truths. And this is the teaching that the Buddha always gave when people were ready. And when they were ready to, to hear that, they often became enlightened, a stage of enlightenment after hearing this. And uh, yes, I was mentioning last night, Uga, Uga uh, from Hatha, Hatha, no, Hatha, Hatha Gama, Hatha Gama. And he was a very interesting case in point. He, he was into partying and everything. And um, he, was, he had uh, four wives, four young wives. They said very beautiful, attractive. And he was into partying. And uh, one night he was partying and everything. And obviously went on into the morning, I'd say. And uh, he, was, he was totally drunk. I think it sounds like it. And he came, met the Buddha. Perhaps it was early that morning. The Buddha was going on arms round or something. And he said the first, they say, the first thing is that he became dead sober when he saw the Buddha. And after that, uh, the Buddha gave him a teaching. I don't know if exactly at that same time, it doesn't seem quite the right time, but uh, he gave him a teaching. It was a gradual teaching. And then he mentions, and then he brought in the Four Noble Truths. And uh, Hat, um, Uga of Hatagama, Gama, he became an anagami, listening to this teaching. Just from having been in party mode, completely in party mode, with these, these dancers, and he had, the interesting thing is, it had repercussions, it had repercussions, because as soon as he became an ana, uh, anagami, he was not interested in sex at all, sexuality, 
And so he said to his four wives, you know, you can now you can stay at home if you wish, but I will be regarding you as sisters, you know, like sisters. But he said, I'll give you the choice. What you, if you wish to go back to your family home, no problem. If you wish to remarry, no problem. And so once some of them did, one of them did remarry and the others, I don't know whether they stayed or went back to their families. Just amazing, really extraordinary. So this is uh, Uga of uh, Hatha, Hatha Gama, yeah, Hatha Gama. And he was, uh, um, you know, he was one of the very unlikely situation, isn't it? <laughs> You're in a party mood, <laughs> party mode, and then suddenly, choo. but it mentions, when the Buddha mentions the eight incredible qualities of this person, Uga of uh, Hatha Gama, the first one is that he became absolutely sober when he saw the Buddha and paid respects to the Buddha and then listened to the teachings, he became absolutely sober. It is pretty surprising. So if we establish our parents in all these four, of course, such a person has done enough and they more than repay their parents. As, as I said before, if you can manage one of them, fantastic. <laughs> and in fact, you know, if you look at it as a sequence, don't, you, you can see that if you can establish somebody in faith, then the others will flow from that in actual fact. Like the indriyas I mentioned, that if you, um, if you develop faith, you'll have energy. If you have energy, then you can apply it to, to mindfulness, sati, uh, being here in the present moment, remembering the teachings is a part of sati as well. And then the mind can develop samadhi, this one-pointedness, and then develop wisdom. So if you manage to establish, uh, if we manage to establish our parents in faith alone, that's, that would be uh, enough. Of course, if one established them in wisdom, that also, that relates to the other factors as well, because they wouldn't see uh, in wisdom, in right view, dana is important, parents are important, virtue is important because of karma. So any of these four actually will, will have an effect. You know, maybe if we establish them in generosity, it might not have as much effect. It could. Um, and uh, so th they all in are interrelated. And virtue, of course, that will have a big effect as well, lead perhaps to the rest of the factors. So last week I mentioned the duties of um, children to their parents from the Sigala Ovada Sutra. People know that one? I think it's a very famous sutra from the Diginikaya, number 31. And in that, the Buddha, I just mention them again, just briefly, because then it's, it completes this sense of repaying our parents and gratitude for, for, for our parents. It's very interesting, actually, respect and gratitude go together. And I was trying to think, are they, which one's causal? But they don't seem to be causal. If you're grateful, you'll have respect. And if you have respect, you'll probably be grateful. Isn't that, that's the case? So they're sort of like co-arising, actually, in a way. So in the uh, uh, Sigala Ubada Sutra, this is where the Buddha details the, the relationships of, you know, practically everybody in society, you know, parents and workers and the relationship to spiritual people, everything. It's uh, what he said about uh, children's response, and it's an interlocking series of uh, duties and uh, responsibilities to each other that is seen as bringing peace to the family or to society, harmony to the society. And sometimes monks will make the point, and I know Arjun Brahm has, it's a very different perspective from our idea of rights. You know, we talk about children's rights. Maybe Do we talk about parents' rights? I've never heard that, actually. <laughs> children's rights we hear about, but not parents. Um, we have an idea of rights. This is how, you know, our, uh, you know, our right, we deserve this. But the Buddha is actually not talking like that. He's talking about in a very practical way the things that bring us together, bind us together, and lead to peace and harmony. And this is what he recommended for children uh, in supporting their parents or repaying their parents. Duties, perhaps, yes. And this is his own words. Having been supported by them, I will support them. Having been supported by them, I will support them. So this is especially when they're sick or they're old. But it doesn't really, I mean, he doesn't really specify that. So it could be any time, you know, and you'll see that in uh, in uh, Asia, Asia particularly in Sri Lanka. Sometimes you see it that the children children are doing their their uh, parents' jobs, helping do them. They're working, um, maybe in the field, working in the shop, whatever, at a very young age. And uh, the second thing he said was, "I will perform." The, uh, that's the 
They will support them. I will perform their duties for them. That's what I've just really talked about, especially when sick or old. So help, help out. And this is not only, you know, in the workplace, of course, at home, helping with the duties at home and so on, which uh, <laughs> I think most par parents would like if their children would help out, and, you know, just clean up after them and, you know, uh, not leave the dirty socks on the floor and all these sorts of things that parents mention. And the third thing the Buddha mentions, I will keep up the family tradition. So this is like these uh, good works that parents do, so things that they are part of the family tradition in Asia and in Buddhist countries. This is very important uh, a sort of heritage, you could say, or a legacy. And last, uh, no, not last, fourth is I will be worthy of my heritage. And this is um, like their inheritance. So it's being worthy of uh, what their parents will give them when they pass away. So to be um, as good as children as possible, as good people as possible, and to preserve the family property as much as possible, to be worthy of my heritage. This is more like inheritance. And then when the parents have passed away, this is a very Buddhist one, I see it, it's, it's the basis of dana sometimes, is after my parents' death, I will distribute gifts on their behalf. And we dedicate the merit to that, that person who's passed away, our parents. But very often, you know, of course, as a Buddhist monk, I see with the, with the meals we, that are offered to the Buddhist monks, either the breakfast dana or the lunch dana, is often in memory of somebody. And we always, I always actually mention that, that we can dedicate the merit, share the merit with those that have passed away. And that is important for, for uh, a number of reasons because it means that it's not just for our benefit because actually we get the benefit first whenever we do anything good, whether we give food, clothing, medicines or shelter to monks, nuns or anybody else for that matter. We get the benefit first. But in terms of sharing the merit, then we feel like it's a benefit to others. It may benefit those that have passed away. And this is very good psychologically to, to think, ah, maybe I'm helping my mother and father or whoever it is who's passed away with this gift, the sharing of this merit, bringing them to mind, remembering them. It's a very powerful, powerful thing. And of course, the best memorial to anybody that's passed away uh, is good actions. If one's done something good, said something good, these things are the things that are like the best memorial. You know, you go to the cemetery, these tombstones and whatever, very nice, <laughs> but it's really the good things people do that are the best memorial. And I thought of that when I saw uh, someone was mentioning to me recently, their husband was having some cancer treatment at the Olivia Newton-John Hospital. And they, they don't charge, uh, they, they're not uh, private, they're not private, they, they don't charge uh, their patients. I thought, fantastic, what a good memorial for somebody, you know, like her, that she did it. Of course, her name's on it, <laughs> but it's a, it is a good memorial, something good that she did, actually, which has had big repercussions. So, so that's the more Buddhist reflections on um, uh, parents, but there are some things that are, you know, it's good to reflect on more general reflections is that with our parents, it's good to remember their goodness and kindness for sure. To focus more on that is, 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 a, um, is more beneficial for us than to focus on their failings and their neg negative qualities. Um, because then we can feel a sense of gratitude for those qualities. And of course, you know, as I mentioned last week, uh, in psychology, we often blame uh, parents for a lot of the problems children experience in their lives. And as I said, from a Buddhist perspective, this is not the whole picture <laughs> because they've brought a lot of the, the, they've brought baggage with them, good and bad baggage with them anyway. And some of those problems are already there. But we do hear horror stories in the newspapers. I remember uh, reading uh, this story uh, in the US where uh, a husband and wife had 13 children, I think, and they chained them up to the beds and they weren't allowed to go out. They didn't feed them properly. I couldn't believe it. I thought, good grief, why would parents do this? When I read these stories, I'm always interested to know where they're coming from. Why did they do this? That's the only interesting thing, really, um, to find out why. And when I, the more I read of that story, it was actually, uh, I think it was a clip from 60 Minutes program they had, actually. 
And um, it, it turned out that the parents were like a product of their conditioning. Their parents had been very abusive and uh, negative parents. So there are parents that, um, you know, are like that. And I, I do reflect, and you might reflect too, I don't know if this is true, I'm not a sociologist, that possibly in countries where we have a belief in uh, rebirth, and we have a belief in respect for parents and elders in general, maybe this sort of abuse by parents is less. This is just my, it's a possibility. Why do I say that? Because if, if one has got a, a, if there is respect for a person, one tends to look up, uh, try to live up to that, isn't it? And that's very true for monks and nuns. And it's a reflection that Ajahn Brahm is often <laughs> telling us as monks, and probably tells the nuns too, you know, to be worthy of the support we get, you know, because we rely on other people com completely. So this is a, possibly it is in countries where there is respect for parents and elders, there may be less of this abuse. I don't know, in Sri Lanka? <laughs> I don't hear of these sorts of cases so much. That doesn't necessarily mean they aren't around, but I don't hear of them. They don't make the newspaper. And this actually brings up one of the things I'm always grateful for. When I read these stories, I don't know for you, if you read these stories of the horror parents, you know, the parents from hell, I always think, Oh, I'm so grateful my parents weren't like that. <laughs> you know, they didn't abuse me, you know, sexually, verbally, uh, physically, uh, emotionally. They weren't like that. So the, the, that's one of the positive sides of these stories, you know, that, um, you know, that most people's parents aren't like that. That's the, the trouble when people read these reports. They may, they may think, oh, so many parents like this. You know? And I, I think there are very, very few that are like this, actually. It's good to keep that in mind. And I know I mentioned, too, uh, I think last week, one English monk, uh, Antanjaya Saru, said, even if our par parents are cruel and callous, they gave us one gift, which is worthy of being grateful for. And that's life. They gave us life. Because without them, we wouldn't be here. And of course, when uh, we, we talk about parents too, and particularly these sorts of uh, very negative experiences, as a monk, I hear people come to me and they talk about their difficult um, childhoods, their, their parents and so on. And some of them, you know, real horror stories, I must admit. I really feel for those, those people. And uh, but one of the very important things is uh, forgiveness. That's absolutely crucial. Forgiveness is, is a quality that, that stems really from metta, from friendliness, uh, maitri, from this, uh, um, this quality that accepts people for what they are. It uh, doesn't condone, uh, condone this sort of negative behaviour, but it also realises that our parents, for instance, are not perfect. But we know, I know actually, that they've done their best. Usually they try to do their best. And most parents do quite a good job, actually. I think they do. And also it's good to reflect. Our parents are not enlightened. They're not awakened. They're not a Buddha or, a, or a, you know, an enlightened being. But at the bottom line, and I think this is the most important thing about forgiveness, because sometimes people, they hang on to these hurts and they feel like they cannot forgive. It's the unforgivable. Uh, it's, un yeah, unforgivable. But I always reflect on one of the, one of the uh, uh, stories that I've seen and read, and there's even videos on it too. And this was Eva Kaur, you know, this uh, I've mentioned before. Everybody says, oh, her, her again. She was a. T uh, she was. Um, she and her sister, uh, were twins were twins, and they were born in. I think it was Hungary. Hungary, and they ended up in a concentration camp in Germany because they were Jewish, and uh, when they came to the concentration camp, the it's really touching actually because, the uh, the they were dividing the people into two groups, one going to the left, one going to the right. The left were actually, they didn't know it, going to the gas chambers, and the right were, were being saved for other purposes. And so they, the Nazis said to her mother, are these your daughters, are they twins? And she said to them, is that a good thing? And they said, yeah, that's good. And so she said, yep, they're twins. <laughs> and they were anyway, I think identical twins. And so they went to the right, and mum and dad and other brothers, to the left, to the gas chambers. And uh, so she, 
Her parents died then, but she, Eva, Eva Kaur and her sister Miriam, I think, Miriam, were used for medical experiments by the Nazis. Pretty horrible, actually, very horrible. And they went through some terrible experiences. But in the 1980s, I think it was, uh, Eva Kaur started working on forgiveness for the Nazis, for what they did, what they did to her family, what they did to her sister and so many other people in the concentration camps. And she said, I, she did, she managed to forgive them, she forgave them. And she said, I didn't forgive them because they deserved it. I forgave them because I deserved it. Because if we don't forgive, we carry this hurt. And it's absolute rubbish, it's toxic. <laughs> we carry it around. So she didn't forgive for the Nazis' benefits, but for her own benefit. And very interesting, the comment she made relates to this even better is that she said, the day I forgave the Nazis for what they did, she said, I forgave my parents. Amazing. You think, what has she got to forgive her parents for? And she says, I forgave them for the fact they couldn't protect us, my sister and myself, from what happened. They died. They couldn't help. They couldn't save them. But a child always feels like their parents should be there for them to protect them, you know. And this is, in that case, not possible for, for her parents. And in a sense, her mother did the best she could by saying, yes, they're twins, is that good? Yes, they're twins, and saving their lives. And of course, if she hadn't done that, then Eva, this uh, Eva Kaur, she wouldn't have gone on to give this teaching about forgiveness, which is her main message in the world. It's not a popular message from, uh, from what I understand for other Holocaust survivors. They look on her as being a betrayer, uh, a traitor, traitor, that's the word. But really, it's just extraordinary. It's a teaching for us too, because we think if she can forgive that, maybe we can forgive some of the hurts in our lives and be free of it, just like she said. She deserved it, not necessarily the Nazis. And of course, the, um, I may be getting close to the end of it, actually, yes. Maybe uh, just to mention, we just chanted the Metta Sutta, and of course that says, Mata yata niyang putang ayusa eka putamanurake emam pisamba bhute sumana sambhava ye aparimanang. And then the translation up there is even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings. So this is the uh, the model that the Buddha used for metta, for maitri, for loving kindness, for friendliness. And even though, you know, we're talking here about a mother's love and it will be for her child, not necessarily the neighbor's child, <laughs> it may not extend that far, the Buddha intends it to be universal. So, and it can be very useful as a meditation uh, support for metta meditation, maitri meditation, to see ourselves as our mother see ourselves as our mother and we are like the babies, baby looking after ourselves, giving this care, this protection to ourselves, this kindness, this soothing, and then to give it to others, start radiating it to family and friends, to, to those that we don't know so well, and then to all beings, seeing them as our children, but having that feeling of connection, of wanting to protect them, being there for them uh, through thick and thin. So the image of a mother's love, I see it, while I was never a parent, I see it in the village where I live in, in Sri Lanka, and I see some of the, the dedication I see of mothers, I think, oh, I couldn't go there. <laughs> I couldn't go there. It's incredible. And uh, the story that came to mind, I love telling this story, you've probably heard it a few times, is a story of Ajahn Jayasaro. He's a famous, uh, well-known, probably, I don't think he liked the word famous, well-known English monk in, uh, who lives in Thailand and he's ordained in the Ajahn Shah tradition. And he, when he was a young man, and he was, I think he was only about eight, 19, he went overland to India and um, he, uh, you know, he, he went, he had money and he went through uh, the Middle East as you could then and it was, it was quite, you know, it was quite a difficult journey anyway then, long uh, bus trips and so on. He went to India and lived as a sadhu, lived as a hermit in a cave, um, not as a Buddhist hermit by any means, which uh, I think is, he w is, was the aim of his going to India. And he did that for quite a while and uh, lived on next to nothing, cooking lentils every day, this sort of thing. And uh, 
after he uh, you know, had run out of money and uh, everything and felt like he'd achieved what he wanted, he decided to go back to England. But he wanted to do it the hard way. Do you know what he did? He didn't have any money. He decided he wouldn't use any money. I don't know if he had any one in. He may have run out of it. It would have been quite convenient, actually. So he wasn't going to use any money. He was going to rely on people's kindness on the journey from, from India all the way back to Britain. And amazingly, you know, he met with a lot of kindness. But the most amazing one was in Tehran, when he was in Tehran, which is in... Iraq, is Iraq, is it? Iran. Iran. That's what I thought was Iran, because you have Tehran. Iran, and the capital of uh, Iran. And he was really down and out, dirty. His clothes were very shabby and he was looking thin because <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't being well fed. And um, he was walking along a street in Tehran and this, this woman saw him and she just beckoned him to follow her. Not, he said, you know, she didn't even smile, <laughs> anything like that. I, I don't know what I would have followed her actually. <laughs> I thought, what's she up to? <laughs> what's she up to? She doesn't look like she's very <laughs> friendly. Anyway, he followed her and she went to this building and uh, he got to the building and then went into the, to the lift or up the stairs to, the, to a flat. It was obviously her home. And she came into the flat, she sat him down at the table. I don't think she said a word to him. She sat him down, pointed to the table and then she made food for him, gave him this food. And then uh, she asked her son to show him the bathroom after he'd eaten so he could wash. He was very smelly and everything. And she gave him new clothes and he put on these new clothes and then when it, that had been finished she took him downstairs probably with very little not a smile evidently but took him downstairs few words back to the street and then she disappeared left him and he thought wow how amazing she has been you know this, this complete stranger to look after me like a mother would look after a child and then he thought hang on my parents did that every day you know, three times a day they fed me actually and they gave me clothes more than once a day, once in my life. And so he realised his thinking had been very shallow actually. He hadn't really, hadn't really appreciated his parents until the, that act of generosity from a stranger. You know, he realised, wow, my parents did this every day, you know. And this woman did it once, but it's pretty remarkable because she didn't know him from, we say, a bar of soap. But she was very kind to him. And of course, I think of... Um, people here, I see people here in the Buddhist society who, who have embodied this, you know, uh, this quality of looking after their parents, going uh, the extra mile, we say, going the extra mile. You know, and I can think of you know, people like Gary, who's looked after his mother and father, and even Ajahn Katapunyu here was looking after his mother for more than six months until she passed away. And uh, last week I was just talking to a woman here, G uh, no, Pina, Pina, who's looking after her mother. And she says she watches this on YouTube <laughs> and she finds it very useful. So this is amazing. When we look after our parents like this, particularly elderly parents, it's not easy. You know, it's a big commitment in time if they're still at home or if they're approaching death. But we should see it as part of our practice. Our practice develop more metta, more kindness, more generosity, more compassion too. And also to see it as part of our practice because it's a teaching that we too, one day, will be going along the same path. Maybe in better circumstances, maybe in worse circumstances, we don't know. So this is something that it's very good to see it in terms of our practice and not something that we, you know, is uh, obstacle to our practice. It's not an easy thing to do. To, to commit your time to look after an ageing parent. And it's very topical this week, of course, for me, because I went to a forum on, uh, it's called High Quality Spiritual Care in Aged Care. So this is very much focused in this area. And uh, it's a very important area, how we look after um, our older people. And of course myself and quite a few of the others there were getting into the category of older people now. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's a very good thing for us to contemplate. And in Buddhist terms, if you see what, uh, what you do comes back to you, you know, what, what, what goes around comes around, you know. So uh, then if we look after our parents well, 
there's a good chance that we'll be looked after well and our spiritual practice also will develop it's part of our spiritual practice so I'd like to finish there and um, ask if there are any questions or comments complaints because I know this is a difficult difficult area yes thank you yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Helen. Yes, yeah, good. Uh, Bante, thank you very much for the talk and mm. a very appropriate week for us because earlier in the week there was a program on Four Corners yes. about um, some of the uh, aged care and what's going on in our nursing mm. homes and um, its problem of of course of government and of sort of some rather greedy corporations but also mm. you know that responsibility we have to our parents I mm. mean some people just seem to end up in these homes and no one visits them it's it's just a tragedy yeah. so thank you thank you yes yes I when I was at this um, on Wednesday I was at this uh, forum on high quality spiritual care in aged care they were talking about that program some of them were very upset by it because they felt like it's not the whole picture and of course it isn't and the convener was saying she was busy texting another another one of the participants at this conference because she was so you know oh no i mean obviously there's there's I, i've visited people in these homes yeah and obviously there's there's staff that really do care about yeah them, they and, do. and you know, Four Corners singled out some pretty intense cases, but it, it does make you think, and it does make you worry as you're getting yes. older. Yes. Do you think we, you, yes, we can think, well, I end up like that, you know, with that sort of treatment and so forth. I always, I think that's a very good point. It's also good to remember there's part two I heard of this program, so let's see what part two brings. This is the horror side, the horror stories that, that comes with it, and always that clash between money and care actually it's they sort of uh, uh, you know at the uh, at this forum they were saying that if one were to fund more care then some of the services that you have to have you don't might not need to have because the care may address it instead of having particular extra services but uh, people like to fund something that's tangible you know which is a bit it's a bit um, it's a bit sad so so I think this was uh, you know it's 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 an area we need to to look at and certainly this forum was very good for that yeah they were the incredible I the thing I was amazed these people are in in, in this industry we call it aged care industry it's an amazing term it's awful isn't it I don't like the word industry myself but it's depersonalizing immediately but uh, they are so enthusiastic and passionate and kind, compassionate, uh, everything. Wonderful, actually, to see. Their, their energy was just amazing. Even the, um, the person who is the regulator for the Australian Standard on Aged Care Facilities, he was there. And he was great. He had a lot of, you know, he was a really compassionate, kind sort of person. Yeah. Yes, if there are any other questions. Um... Comment. Having been through this myself, how do you deal with parents that disown you? Oh, right. How do you deal with <laughs> parents that disown you? Because of something that you've done that doesn't resonate with their, you know? Yeah. 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 Oh, that's a very interesting thing. I think, uh, you know, you, you can only do your best with parents disown you, you know, and try not to, you know, it's pretty hard, I would think. I don't know how you took it, but the sense of rejection, it, could be enormous actually you know to feel that your parents have disowned you uh, and to be able to forgive that is, is not easy it's a hard one because parents you know the ideal we have for parents and uh, it's it's it, it is an ideal but it is a practical thing is a, a parent that's there for you no matter what as Ajahn Brahm puts it the door of my heart is always open to you like that's what his father said to him you know so the parent that can be there with you no matter what you do is is really the ideal and some parents can go there and some parents can't for those that can't we have to have forgiveness for 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 their shortcomings you know and later they may regret it they may think oh we shouldn't have done that you know because for anybody to disown another person is quite a strong act you know and that will create a hurt for them you, you don't really you don't really want to take revenge, as it were, 
but you know it'll have consequences for them to have done that is, is a strong thing. Because it's not only from um, a children to parents, it's parents to children too. So for them, that, that's something that they have to live with as well. So if you can forgive for your own benefit, if not, you know, not for theirs, they may have passed away by now. So, um, you know, this is good to keep in mind, forgiveness. Yeah, I hope that sort of answers it a bit. It's not an easy thing. Some of these things are not easy at all, actually. So there we are. Oh. This was more of a comment, but I was mm. uh, listening to Helen there about the yeah. program. I didn't watch the program, but I um, was it. aware of, of, of a lot of what was in it. But the other thing is, we know it's so difficult, but um, they're, they're attempting to help old people elderly people in their homes but then you find out that somebody's had a stroke and is meant to manage at home and it takes a year one year before the home assistance package yeah. becomes available so you know it, it's got it, it's got to be looked at beyond the profit motive altogether to call it an industry is pretty frightful i think it is um yeah. so you know even the attempts to be independent and look after yourself mm. are not well supported that was just a comment thank you oh, thank you for that call that's a very good point actually and i must admit you know some of them you know there there were uh, private uh, providers at uh, at this forum our care were there and they were fairly impressive, and the Christians very well represented, you know, Baptist care, uniting care, and so on. And they were really, really, uh, really good people. And the emphasis at that forum, it's the, the uh, hosting body is the, uh, what's it called? Meaningful Aging Australia. And their, like, motto is that spirituality is more than religion. Spirituality is more than religion. And that's a good point, actually. And it addressed many people these days are anti-religious and I hear this quite often people say this anyway to me and I, so yes yes Dr. Uh, uh, <coughs> from this uh, talk by you this morning mm. uh, what I gather in the sense is that uh, uh, the you do so much for your parents of course yeah. you create good conditions for yourself a good karma yeah, you good. will benefit from that but uh, a little you do in the way of putting them into the right path with mm -hmm. as you said right view mm -hmm. giving dhamma to help them to understand dhamma and to deliver from sansara mm -hmm. that is uh, for yes. deliverance that is suffering he is far greater little you do to get out of sansara mm -hmm. he is far greater than the merits you accumulate by looking after them yes yeah, very good, very good point. And that's the, that's the value of a Buddha, actually, that gives us right view, a way of looking at reality that can actually bring us into accord with reality. Because this is where, where all the unsatisfactoriness and suffering comes in, is that we're, we're out of kilter with what's really the nature of our existence. You know, we're, we're looking for permanence in things that can't be, cannot be permanent. They cannot last. We're looking for permanent happiness in things that cannot provide permanent happiness and we're looking for a real sense of who I am you know a solid sense of that that's <coughs> it's also permanent and we can't we can't find that and that's once we have right view we're on the way to finding out uh, the real the nature of reality and living more in accord with that and of course a Buddha and an enlightened being right then they don't have to have right view they are right view because we often say this you know, that their being Dhamma, their, their being is Dhamma. So that view that the Buddha taught was not something that he had to have a view about anymore. He knew this is the way it is, you know, and that's why he was teaching that. That's very useful. But for us, we don't have to, we have to, you know, as Buddhists, we can take it on board um, and investigate. Investigate, is there Kamma, is there rebirth? Uh, well, there certainly are parents, but what are the consequences of parents and, and the consequences of dana? Are there beings that really have seen the nature of reality, etc.? We can investigate those things for ourselves. So that's the encouragement of a Buddha, to point out the way, not to walk the way for us. You can't do it. <laughs> can't do it. So it'd be very nice if you could. So now we can, I think that's it, finish off. Maybe just, I'll do a little bit different. You can join in because uh, Sri Lankan people will know this as a, like sharing of merit. 
Akazantan Shambhumantan Devanaga Mahindika Punyang Tang Anumoditwa Chirang Rakam Tu Sasanam Akazantan Shambhumantan Devanaga Mahindika Punyang Tang Anumoditwa Chirang Rakam Tu Desanam Akazantan Shambhumantan Devanaga Mahindika Ponyang tang anumodi twa chirang rakam tu mang parantis.